So hello, everyone, and welcome <laughs> uh, to the Microstructure Exchange. We're back after the summer break. Hopefully, everybody had a productive and uh, joyful summer. Uh, we have an exciting program for this fall. We just posted it on the webpage this morning, if you'd like to take a look. We wanted to apologize to all of you for being really slow with uh, finalizing the program this um, this year. We are all just absolutely swamped, as it turned out, but we're, we're catching up. So there will be some emails going out uh, in the next day or two, hopefully. Um, and I wanted to, by the way, take this opportunity to thank the reviewers um, of the papers that were submitted um, for review. Thank you so much for your um, help. Uh, without you, we wouldn't be able to build this program. So this is all from me on the organizational. Um, and today we are very excited to have Chris Schwartz with a uh, very interesting uh, paper about what happens when academics trade in the modern stock market. Uh, so Chris asked us to hold our questions until he stops four questions. Chris, probably about somewhere around 15 and 30 minute marks. Um, and then, of course, there should be plenty of time for questions after the 45-minute um, presentation. Um, Chris, we forgot to ask you if you're willing to stay a little bit over the hour. So, okay, so then we'll have plenty of time. And, of course, there is a chat uh, function that's available if you guys want to put your questions in there. Uh, some of Chris's co-authors are here, so they may uh, be willing to answer those questions as we go. Uh, this is all from me. Chris, again, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, please take it away. Uh, my pleasure. So uh, so the shocker here is academics trading lose money. So I don't think we needed to write a research paper on that, but uh, that's basically what we end up uh, finding. So um, but anyway, thanks so much for having me here. Um, as I warn the organizers, I know zero about microstructure. Um, I, I know about being silly and losing money, and thankfully I found some co-authors willing to do UC Irvine. I actually have a visiting uh, position um, at, uh, at Columbia between Irvine and, and uh, New York and Zoom is telling me it's crashing. So hopefully it keeps going. Uh, so just a little uh, background. So I think it was set up well. So I'm going to, in segment one here, I'm going to talk a little bit about the intro background and the experimental design. Um, segment two, I'll talk about our results from our experiment. And then at the end, I'll explain um, how we try to, what we see as our execution differences. And then concluding, uh, of course, we'll see how good my execution is on, on the time here. So hopefully uh, I can be pretty good on time. All right, so a little motivation on this. Of course, uh, we all know the markets changed incredibly uh, back in October 2019. That's essentially when all major brokers went commission free. Um, and based on our trading, I'd say that pretty much the entire market really shifted at that point. Um, and of course, we had GameStop happen in 2021. And the SEC wrote a report on it. And, and part of the quote here is investors should be mindful of how their orders are handled, including the difference between free and no commissions, right? So everyone's no commissions. Um, and a lot of people think that means free. <clears throat> and you can see the SEC is trying to make sure people understand that no commissions does not equal uh, free. And you can think a little bit of the motivation of this paper is basically, well, how much is, is how free is not free? Um, and then essentially the second question is, you know, and how much is free not the same everywhere? So I wish I could say that we were very fortuitous that we could see these results coming when we started this paper, but actually, the real way this project gets started is in the same way that most things happen on a Bob Ross painting, uh, which is we don't have mistakes, we have happy accidents. And by the way, Bob Ross is amazing. He's the only person who can put students to sleep faster than I can with his. But really, we didn't start this project at all looking and thinking there'd be execution differences. Actually, this project started. Uh oh. Am I back? You are. All yes. right, good. Um, so the motivation of this project actually was to look at BJZZ. So if you're not familiar with BJZZ, I so most people in this group are. Uh, they use subprinting pricing basically to try to pick retail trades off the tape. And so we did a project on Robinhood and we used BJZZ in it. And we did a little couple of test trades on to see how well it worked in practice. Um, and, you know, so I was like, well, why don't we set up a brokerage account and do a bunch of systematic trades and see how it does. And, um, and everyone thought, oh, well, that sounds a little bit crazy. We don't need to do that. And, um, of course I am crazy. My mom had me certified on like Sheldon Cooper. So I decided to set up a brokerage account and start trading. Um, and so I started trading actually using a Robinhood account because we had one set up because we did the Robinhood paper. Um, and I thought, well, we probably need more than one brokerage account. Um, 
just to make sure, but it should be all the same because all brokers have best execution. Um, and so basically I set up these two brokerage accounts and we'll talk about the experimental design later, but essentially trading the same stocks at the same time. Um, and the first day we traded was December 21st, 2021. Um, and if I can get it to go, so this is uh, my Robinhood account. Um, and you can see the first day on my Robinhood account, I lost $150.43. And then I logged into my TD Ameritrade account and I made $12.61. Um, and so of course I'm staring at my screen and I was getting ready to yell at my RA for not <laughs> being able to trade the same stocks at the same time. And after going through my trade confirmations, I realized that um, she had not messed up and we were trading the same stocks at the same time. And we'll talk about latency later, but actually in this particular day, Robinhood trades went first every single time. So from a latency perspective, Robinhood had a dominating advantage over TD and you can still got, uh, got its lunch handed to them. And that's essentially how this uh, project got started uh, in terms of looking at execution quality. And so the question becomes, you know, how pervasive are these price execution differences? Um, are these price uh, differences predictable based on SEC and brokerage disclosures? Um, and what explains these execution differences? And of course, if you've been paying attention to the SEC, there's all sorts of things they wanna change uh, about retail trading, including eliminating payment for order flow. And so that's one of the things we focus on uh, in the paper, right? So these are our research questions. <clears throat> now, of course, we have the history of commissions here. Um, so I'm very fortunate. Uh, I actually, my parents would let me trade back in the 80s. Uh, so my dad would pick up the phone and call his, uh, I don't know, American Express who owned that uh, particular brokerage at the time back in the 80s. Uh, but of course, it was like $80 to make a trade for 100 shares of stock. Nobody worried about spreads so much because commissions were so high. Uh, then, of course, in the late 90s, we had the online broker start where they took commissions down to 20 bucks. Um, then things went down further. And, of course, uh, we were at $5 commissions uh, when Robinhood made things commission-free in 2015. Um, and then 2019, Schwab decided to go commission-free, and everybody basically followed that. Um, although Interactive Broker still has a pro account with commissions, uh, which is one of the accounts we'll trade, and we'll talk about that. Uh, in a little bit. And shockingly, as you reduce commissions, of course, you reduce the cost of trading. Um, essentially, the number of shares people are willing to trade in a particular trade has gone down. So this is from the same GameStop report from the SEC. This is the percentage of the market that's odd lots. Um, and you can see that odd lots are less than 20% of the market uh, 10 years ago. Um, and now odd lots are basically 60% of the market. In fact, for the stocks that we trade in our sample here, if you look at TAC, one share or less trades are actually 26% of the market for the stocks that we trade. So we're talking, you know, the market went from a hundred share or more market, you know, a decade ago, basically to, you know, a very low number of shares per trade um, in this particular market. And if you're not aware, if you trade a fractional share, it shows up on TAC as one share. Uh, so you won't see each fractional shares on TAC, it'll just be one share. So even if you trade 0.01 shares of Burke A, it basically shows up a one share trade uh, on TAC. All right, so of course the problem is that regulations are incredibly outdated. Uh, so in 2005, uh, 2005, the SEC started NMS, <clears throat> uh, but MS is really focused on round lots. So this is usually more than 100 shares, 100 shares and more. And so NBBO is essentially based on this quantity, right? So for you to be an NBBO quote, you have to be at least 100 shares at that particular price or a, a multiple thereof. Uh, and so, you know, if you go to all these brokers, so this is Netflix, you can tell I captured this a long time ago because Netflix stock is not 258 bucks anymore. But essentially, if you go to every one of the brokers that we trade at the same moment in time, you're going to see that you have exactly the same quote, exactly the same bid, exactly the same ask. Um, so you can even see here, like if you look that says, you know, ARCX, you can see is the same for, for all the brokers here. Um, and this is based on 100 shares. And of course, you can see actually here the bid ask is, you know, 700 and 600 shares. Um, and of course, if most of the market's odd lot, <clears throat> it's lower share count than we have on NBBO. And that's basically what's enabling, ultimately what we're gonna find is a bunch of huge price differences between all the brokers, right? And it's basically because these regulations are outdated. Within that, brokers have a, a, a duty to have best execution for their clients, all right? So uh, it kind of sort of, but not really means that uh, your price can't be worse than NBBO. Uh, if you ask the SEC how you can have different prices at different brokers and they all can have best execution, um, the SEC will say, well, best execution is a very fuzzy term that can mean lots of things like latency, or you have size improvement if you're putting in big things. Um, you have aggregate best execution that doesn't have to be for a particular client. Um, and so there's all sorts of fuzziness that goes around um, best execution. 
These days, if you do trade though, you're probably gonna get something called price improvement, which means you're gonna get pricing better than NBBO. All right, so that means that if you buy a share of stock that you don't have to pay the ask, you pay something less than the ask. And if you sell a share of stock, you don't get the bid, you get something slightly more than the bid. So for example, on that screen I just showed you, uh, Netflix had a bid ask of, uh, I'm just gonna use the decimal here, 80 cents and 90 cents, right? So that you got more than 80 cents if you sold, you, got, you paid less than 90 cents if you bought. Um, and in theory, if you're really lucky, every single time you trade, you basically spit, split the bid ask quote. So if you have a price improvement of 50% of the spread, then trading truly is free, right? So you'd buy at 85 cents, you'd sell at 85 cents, you don't pay any commissions. At that point, trading is free. So from an economic perspective, uh, a PI of 50% is basically the best that you'd uh, expect uh, in your pricing. <clears throat> All right. And so the question becomes, well, how much price improvement do you get? And that's one of the questions here that we're, we're going to find out. Related to payment for order flow, all right, and execution quality, the SEC actually authorizes payment for order flow currently in here in the US. Uh, of course, as noted earlier, they're trying to, they're talking about banning it now. Um, the, so the implication there is that execution quality is negative or related to payment for order flow amounts. Um, payment for order flow is already banned in the UK, Canada, and Australia, and the EU, EU is, uh, is considering a total ban. So the EU is a bit of a mess. They don't even have a consolidated tape. Um, and so it's kind of a disaster over there in terms of you can be in Germany where they outlawed in another country they don't outlawed and then of course you can open a broker there brokerage account there and, and different things are happening. Uh, for the SEC, however, they're concerned about payment for order flow, even though they authorized it, and so they require several disclosures which we're going to take advantage of so there's what's called rule 606 so this is for the broker so every quarter um, they release data uh, on what kind of payment for order flow they got where they routed your trades to what kind of wholesalers or what kind of venues. So if they routed your trades to Citadel or Virtue or the New York Stock Exchange, um, and then they tell you this by S&P 500 or non-S&P 500 stocks. Then there's rule 605. So 605 applies to Citadel, all right? And Virtue and ATSs, et cetera. <clears throat> and on that report, they have to tell you for each type of trade and different types of trade sizes, they have to tell you what average execution they gave you. So they have to tell you on average how much price improvement there was or the effective spread. Uh, they basically have to give you uh, statistics on how they do. Now, please note these are across all trades. So if you go to Citadel and you look up Apple and you look up market trades, it'll just give you the average execution for all Apple market trades of a particular size. They don't break them down by where those particular trades started. So it's just an aggregate number uh, that they provide. The additional disclosure that we're going to take advantage of is something called Rule 606B1 and B3. Uh, and these particular rules, you can go to your broker, you can require or request that the broker tell you for each one of the trades you place, which market centers they went to. Um, so specifically for all the trades we place, we know essentially what market center or what venue our trades went to to be executed. The only exception to this is Interactive Broker has never responded to our requests for a 606. So I think uh, Philippe had that account and he's uh, request, I think, six or seven different ways. Um, and they've never even acknowledged that we've requested the data, even though we've he sent um, emails and uh, he's actually sent them a certified letter that they we know they received and they still haven't responded uh, to our requests. All right, so that's uh, execution quality. All right, so uh, in terms of our design, so I'll talk a little bit of our design and then I'll, I'm gonna take a break here and let you everybody ask questions. Um, so essentially what we ended up doing was we opened six different brokerage account at five brokers. All right. And so the important thing about what we did here is we picked brokers and brokerage accounts that differed by payment for order flow amounts. So we have three brokerage accounts that have varying payment for order flow. So they have positive payment for order flow uh, and the amount differs between them. Um, and all of them basically use wholesalers exclusively to execute their trade. So everything you put in that brokerage account goes to Virtue, Citadel, G1X, uh, Jane Street, um, UBS, or I'm forgetting the sixth one off the, my head, but those are basically the, the wholesalers that you go to. One has no payment for order flow, um, but they use the same wholesalers, right? So you have uh, someone that doesn't get payment for order flow, but basically goes to the same venues. Uh, we have one account uh, that has no payment for order flow, charges commissions, but does not use any of the typical wholesalers. So according to their 606, they route all of their trades to one of the exchanges, or their own internal ATS. And then we have uh, another account that has payment for order flow, uh, does not charge commissions, but again, they use uh, they don't use the typical wholesalers. Uh, so again, they supposedly route all their trades to exchanges, 
um, and their own ATS. And the last two are the same broker and basically the last two are with Interactive Broker. All right, so, uh, so again, we don't know for sure where our trades go because they won't give us our 606 data. <clears throat> what we do is we place approximately 85,000 parallel market orders worth about $16 million over 5.5 months. So as noted earlier, we start at the end of December um, and we go 5.5 months. And we basically ended the experiment in, in mid-June. Uh, June 9th, we are actually still trading three of the brokerage accounts every day. Um, so right now, you know, three of the accounts are, are actually actively trading still. Um, we haven't looked at the data since June, so it probably is interesting at this point to, to look and see what the data looks like. Uh, so we did stagger the, the brokerage account starting. Uh, so of course, uh, TD and Robinhood started on, on December 21st. Um, at that point, uh, we thought, well, we'd want to start Interactive Broker Pro. Um, and the reason we did that one next is because they don't have payment for order flow uh, and they have an API we can use. So that was uh, January 25th. Uh, then we started E-Trade, that was in March, 2016. Um, and then finally, we added a couple of brokers that as I mentioned, we had to trade by hand. So Fidelity doesn't give access to their API or does Interactive Broker for the Light account. And so we hand traded those over about six week period starting in, in April. Um, later on, we'll control for our time differences. When we started this, you know, we'll only look at trades that overlap between particular brokers. Um, but the bottom line is the gaps here in terms of not perfectly overlapping is not going to impact our, our results at all. All right, what do we trade? Uh, so essentially, we use CRISP 2021Q2. Uh, we created a stratified sample of 128 stocks. So essentially, we created a representative sample of stocks from all stocks uh, that are uh, 10 and 11 uh, using price, market cap, volatility, and liquidity. Uh, we also added 10 stocks for four retail darlings. So you can see some typical examples there like AMC and Tesla and Sundial Growers. And then we added six mega cap stocks, Exxon, Verizon, Google, Apple, NVIDIA, and Bank of, uh, uh, Bank of America uh, were uh, some mega stocks we included. And every single day, because the top movers on Robinhood generate a significant amount of retail volume every day, every day, we included the four top movers that had a price of one dollar or more um, each day, right? So you can see some of this uh, sample selection was based on the fact that we're testing BJZZ, um, but of course this also works for this particular experiment that we're doing here. Uh, how we traded, all right? So we had four accounts were traded through the API. Uh, so uh, four accounts had their API access. As I mentioned, Fidelity and Interactive Broker Lite did not, and we hand traded those. But we knew the exact moment that the trades were going to be executed through the API and we could go ahead and trade at the same time by hand. Orders are submitted basically at the same time in a sequential order, right? So it's not like we had one program that dumped all four orders at precisely the same time. There's basically a serial order that the orders went through. Um, and then what would happen is the order of the brokers would be randomized. So sometimes TD would go first, sometimes E-Trade would go first, sometimes Interactive Broker would go first, et cetera. And so ultimately, no broker has an advantage, which I'll, I'll show you coming up. Uh, each day we started at 9.40 uh, and ended at 3.50. Uh, so we didn't do the opening and closing auction, uh, and we didn't hold positions overnight, except for the, when the Robinhood API crashed us. Um, trades were spaced out pretty evenly over the course of the day, so I think we did a trade every two or three minutes, uh, essentially. Uh, and then we did you know, just totally random buying and selling. So stocks were purchased, and then within 30 minutes, they were sold. Uh, so, of course, we had some exposure to the market, but not too much. Um, and just to make sure things were completely randomized, we didn't trade the same stock at the same time every day. Basically, the timing that the stock, each particular stock would trade would rotate over time. So someone trade at, at 9.40 one day, then you know, 10 o'clock the next day, and they kind of just rotate through the day. So that, that was even randomized. <clears throat> Our target trade size was 100 bucks. Uh, this was actually chosen after we did a lot of testing. So we actually tested $1,000 trades in January. Um, and in March, we did trades up to $5,000 and we essentially got the same execution. Um, and so we decided that instead of losing more money than we had to, since $100 trades are giving us exactly the same results and exactly the same execution, um, that we shouldn't lose any more money um, than we had to. Please note, we do not do fractional share trading in this particular paper. Uh, the minimum trade size is one share. So even though we traded $100, uh, that was our trade size. If we traded Google and it was $3,000, we trade a complete share uh, of Google. All right, so I think it's been probably about 15 minutes. So I think this is probably a good, a good stopping point before I get into some more statistics. So if uh, people have questions, I've been checking the chat, but um, if people have questions, please fire away. Um, folks, let's, um, let's try the raise hand button just to introduce some order um, into this. 
And uh, while um, while people are looking for the raise hand button, Chris, a quick question for me. So you mentioned market orders. Um, did you try marketable limits, or is it all market orders purely? Um, so we did um, we did a couple of tests with marketable limit orders, and they got horrible execution. Um, so marketable limit orders got significantly worse execution than market orders. So I believe there's an academic paper which I don't remember off the top of my head from like 20 years ago that same found the same thing. Uh, but certainly, if you look at our brokers, you are much better off doing market orders than market limit orders. So we did like a two day test on on those. When you say horrible execution, you mean uh, price improvement was much less <laughs> than what you got from market orders? Oh, yeah, that's correct. So just to give you, I mean, we'll come up with some data. So TD Ameritrade, for example, gave us on average 47% price improvement on our trades and market orders. Uh, I believe on the market of 11 orders, it was like 5%. Um, okay. And the same thing with Robinhood. So Robinhood's marketable limit orders got much worse execution than their market orders. Um, we did talk, talk to Schwab, and Schwab told us they were not they were not surprised we got worse execution. So, so uh, we, we've been fortunate or unfortunate, depending on your perspective, <coughs> to talk to a lot of different people at this point. Um, and so they've told us things that we have no way to prove or not prove. So the idea basically is. Uh, marketable limit orders are used by smarter people, so they view that as more, you know, information asymmetry, and so they give them more pricing. So. Yeah, um, Jim, um, did you have a question or comment? Uh, hang on a second here. <clears throat> um. Yeah, the, uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, interactive brokers on their uh, trade report do show you where they sent the orders in virtually real time. So uh, they may not be giving you 606 reports, but uh, yeah, I can look on my trading screen and see exactly where they sent the orders. Uh, usually it's uh, to their own ATS. Yeah, I mean, um, so uh, I know Philippe's on the call, it's his account. So Philippe can take a look at that. I know for their light account, it just, Go ahead, Philippe, if you want to respond to that. Yeah, we, we looked at that. It was uninformative. The 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 venues are called dark. Uh, and and uh, but uh, on on some of the accounts and on the on the other account, uh, you don't have the same uh, level of detail as you get from the brokers when you ask the specific venue. So essentially, it's not informative. And, and I asked several times, I didn't get any answer. So there, there is some some detail. If if you click on the plus, you you, you open the the line. You have more information, but it's not very informative. But I agree that overall, uh, a lot of the trades go through that on ATS, which, as we know, um, does not provide very good execution, as some other papers have shown. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, so we we know for so the one thing we can tell you is obviously we we're, we match all of our trades to TAC. So I don't really mention that, but all of our trades we match to TAC. Um, and so we know through TAC what, you know, if they were exchange D or not exchange D. And basically um, almost all of our orders, regardless if they're on the pro or the light account on, on IBKR, um, they're executed in the dark pool. So and unless they're lying on their 606, that means that most of our trades are going to their ATS. Um, and if it's their own ATS, I'm sure they don't want to tell us that information because the execution is no bueno. So I'm sure they don't want to let everybody know. Um, that their own ATS has given their crappy execution. The New York Stock Exchange told me if I if we routed our RBK directly to the exchange, we'd probably get much better execution. <clears throat> but I think Philippe's lost enough money on that account, so I don't think we're going to try that out. <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, Chris, let's let's go ahead then. Sure. All right. So, um, either I put everybody asleep, or I'm not that good at explaining things. But anyway, we, we'll keep rolling here. Uh, all right, so let's talk about same time. So I, I would tell you probably the two biggest things we've gotten comments on is same time, right? So, you know, E-Trade has been up in arms about eight milliseconds. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about same time here. So obviously we can't trade at the exact same millisecond, right? Um, so we're not saying um, that every single trade is being executed at exactly the same moment in time. Of course, we all know from mathematics, if you have a continuous distribution, you basically can't have two things at the same time, but anyway, that's different. Uh, this, the, the, the area under uh, a curve at any particular moment in continuous distribution is zero. But anyway, um, so we can't trade the same, same millisecond, but we do make sure there's no bias per broker. So the first thing I told you is basically we randomized order, right? So if you look in the appendix of the paper, and I'll spend a few minutes on this just because a lot of the questions we've gotten about latency. Um, so essentially you can see like how often we submit 
uh, orders for one broker versus the other first. Now there are some latency differences in API. So you can see interactive brokers in late, uh, API is a bit slower than some of the other APIs. Actually TD by far has the fastest API in terms of latency. Um, but what you can see here, you know, even with these differences in terms of which gets executed first, you know, submission time, I wanna know if this is submission time and now I'm gonna to get to execution time next. Um, you can see that basically the difference in our median execution time is uh, at worst about 12 milliseconds difference or 16 milliseconds difference, right? Which is a lot, but remember we're making tens of thousands of trades, right? So if you think about the number of trades on each side in terms of a broker, uh, given the differences we're gonna document, these, these latency differences aren't, aren't that big. More importantly, if you go to execution time, um, which is even more important, um, basically you can see for almost all of our pairs between brokers, the execution median time is different. Meaning literally we have the same amount of trades on each side. So each broker has the same opportunity to go first. Um, again, you can see here that TD is slightly faster than E-Trade by three milliseconds. Um, and you can see that TD is about 10 milliseconds on average faster than IP. All right, so, um, so just to kind of put this to bed, you know, E-Trade was after us about latency. I provided them results where I only, I only gave them results for E-Trade went first and TD went second, and they're the exact same ones I'm gonna report here. Um, and I'll have more information. We have a regression where we're gonna show trade order doesn't matter um, for our particular trades. So again, latency here between our, our brokers is essentially equal. You know, nobody really has an advantage. Um, the other thing I'll say is, you know, if the API choked, um, so just for fun, I'll tell you that Robinhood's API basically went four and a half hours and couldn't fill a market trade on Goldman Sachs. Um, so sometimes the APIs had a little bit of problems. Um, so we screen out any trades that have a difference of more than two seconds. So we have a parallel trade and the difference between the execution time is more than two seconds. Um, that was incredibly rare. So we, that only would take out a few trades um, from our sample. So we wanna make sure we're very careful here with execution time differences. All right, so here's some summary statistics. All right, so you can see we did about 85,000 trades. We have about 75,000 in our final sample. You're wondering where 10,000 trades went. Um, so we had a lot of test trades in there where we, you know, for example, we traded E-Trade by, you know, by itself for three days. So that was a thousand trades that got screened out IB. So every time we added new brokers, we did tests to make sure it wasn't gonna crash the API. Uh, we also did trades. Uh, there's sometimes the API crashed. So we weeded out one-sided trades. So for all of these, we have both sides of the trade. And then again, we have some that got weeded out based on milliseconds. If you don't use any screens at all and use the same sample, you get exactly the same uh, thing we do here. Uh, so you can see our median execution price about $74. You can see you have a bit, pretty big spread. Um, you can see on average, our price improvement was 5.8 cents across all of our trades. Um, the average bid ask spread was 17 cents with a median of five cents. Uh, one of the things that we've, you know, definitely the number of stocks with a one cent spread has decreased over time. So we have this in our BJZZ paper as prices have gone up, spreads have gone up quite a bit. Um, you can see that our median um, price was 64%. Uh, you know, the spread in terms of percentage of price is 64% with a median of 28 basis points. Our dollar trade size is $157 on average. Again, we, we aim for $100. We had some bigger trades in there. And our average trade size was 16. So admittedly, we have some on average small trades here, but again, I'll show you some results later where if we did $1,000 or $5,000 trades, we would have ended up in exactly the same place here. Uh, admittedly, probably if we did $50,000 trades, we would have got something different. Uh, but, uh, but again, I think for average retail size that you'd be talking about, you know, $1,000, $5,000 that these results would be uh, the same. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna measure price improvement in three different ways. All right, so the first way we're gonna measure it is just in terms of cents or dollars, if you wanna think about it that way. Um, so obviously as you buy, all right, so you should pay the offer price, NBBO, NBO is the worst you can pay. We're gonna subtract off the price we pay, so that tells us how much we saved. Of course, the sell side is the opposite way, how much we sold for minus the bid. Uh, so that's gonna be in dollars. We're gonna turn that into uh, by percent. So we're gonna look at how much it is as a percent of the spread. Um, and just a preview, basically, it looks like the market centers are really targeting percent of the spread, um, as I'll show you with some results coming up. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, um, a lot of people who aren't familiar with price improvement, everybody kind of understands returns, right? That's why IR is so popular compared to NPV, even though NPV is better. Um, and so we basically try to calculate our round trip trade costs. And so what we do is we have our, you know, we have our return here on our trade. So sell price minus buy price over buy price, that's our return. Um, and then we try to back out what the market did during that time period. 
So we actually calculate what the return would have been if we traded, uh, sorry, this shouldn't be NBBO, this should be at the midpoint. So this should say midpoint, sorry. Um, so basically what we did was we assumed that you sold at the midpoint, bought at the midpoint, um, what the return would be. So you can think about this as the market return. Again, this should not be NBBO, this should say midpoint. Um, so we have our return minus the midpoint return and that should essentially give you the costs of our round trip trade. Um, many brokers will claim, uh, claim price improvements. All right, so that's uh, basically a, a one zero variable. It's incredibly easy um, to have price improvement in this market, right? That's basically like saying if someone gets a senior class, they can claim they can get an A. Um, so just looking at the percentage of trades to get price improvement um, is really easy as you'll see in our results coming, uh, coming up. All right, so what that says is Bob Barker used to say, let's see what the actual retail price here of our trades, which is uh, where the title, I love Bob Barker. It's the only good thing about getting the flu as a kid. I got to watch uh, the price is right at 11 in the morning. So I think basically this graph sums up what happened to us. All right, so let me explain this graph to you real quick. So this is a cumulative frequency difference of our price improvement as a percentage of the spread. Um, so obviously the best price improvement you can have is 100%, which is incredibly rare, which means that basically you buy at the bid and you sell at the offer, right? So you basically get the best possible pricing. And as I mentioned, 50% is basically the midpoint is what you're economically on average can have for best pricing because that's where trading is free. So you can see very few of our trades executed um, at better than midpoint, right? So you can see our price improvement was better than midpoint, um, but you can see it's not, uh, it does happen, right? So if you use Lee Ready or uh, to, to sign trades, there are gonna be some trades that are wrong, especially for TD Ameritrade. Um, so basically once we hit midpoint, you know, everything goes crazy here. So just to give you some data here, so for TD Ameritrade, 69% of our trades were at midpoint or better, right? So basically 69% of our trades were either free or in some sense we got paid to trade. Um, and then you can see all the way at the bottom is Interactive Pro where basically 15% of our trades are at midpoint or better, right? So you can see once we get to the midpoint, even before the midpoint for TD, um, there become these huge execution differences between what we see. So basically you have TD way at the top, you have Fidelity and E-Trade kind of neck and neck. Uh, you have Robinhood steps below that. Um, and then you have our two interactive broker accounts at the bottom, All right? So I think this graph basically sums up in, in terms of our experiment, in terms of what kind of execution we got. Um, this really kind of sums up uh, what we found here, which was um, we had much different execution between our accounts. So if we turn this into numbers, all right? So this is the percentage of our trades with price improvement. Uh, so you can see the, the hurdle here is pretty low when you're talking that you know, most of the brokers you know, easily give you 80% plus where they give you better than NBBO. Uh, but again, if you look at, at spread, this is kind of where you see the big differences. Um, so again, you can see that TD is by far number one. Um, they're really close to free trading, right? So they basically give you price improvement that's 47% of the spread. Um, and then you can see all the way at the bottom, you have Interactive Lite or Interactive Pro, which is you know, only about 20% of spread. Fidelity and, uh, and E-Trade, you can see are neck and neck. Uh, and then Robinhood's father behind us. Uh, Fidelity actually has some really good data on their price execution that they make public. Uh, I should note here that our percentage of uh, price improvement relative to the spread matches really well um, what they do. So this is all trades. And panel B of table five, if you want to look, we actually only do trades where they're parallel with both brokers. Everything looks exactly um, as the same as you see here. Um, so. If you look at big versus small trades, as I mentioned, it really doesn't matter. So in January, we did $100 trades and $1,000 trades at the same time. Again, order was randomized here. If you look across all trades, you can basically see our price improvement was the same. And if you look at our three brokers here, you can say, A, the order is the same, regardless if we did $100 or $1,000 trades. Um, and you can really see that there's no significant difference between the amount of price improvement we got. Um, and then later on in March, we did basically trades of specific share sizes. So we did one, two, five, 10, 25, 50, 70, 100 shares, uh, stocks up to $50. So these trades are up to $5,000 trades. And I don't have it by broker here. It doesn't matter if you do by broker, but again, you can see here our execution between our $100 trades and these trades up to $5,000 was again, exactly the same. So again, we didn't do bigger trades because we didn't want to lose even more money. All right, just a couple other um, things to show you here real quickly. And I know that I got to take a break here. I don't want to go over. Um, so again, uh, we want to make sure trade order didn't matter. So we ran a regression. Um, this is clustered by stock uh, where we have our broker dummies here. So our intercept here is TD goes first, or in this particular case, TD, sorry, this is TD. This dummy is TD is, uh, goes first. So they're the first one in our execution order. Um, you can see the broker dummies are huge here. Then we had dummies for if you're the second trade, third trade, or if you're the fourth or more trade. 
Um, you can see none of these results are significant. We do the same thing for our trades at $1,000. So again, you can see the broker results are huge, uh, but you can see there's no significant difference in execution quality if you went first or second or third um, in this particular trade. All right, uh, a couple more things, and then again, I'll take a, a break here and take questions. Uh, so if you look at round trip trade costs, uh, obviously you're gonna get the same order as if we use price improvement. Um, so you can see TD is by far number one. And all of the brokers do give you price improvement that's better than NBVO. And uh, again, these are clustered by <coughs> stock and highly significant. Um, and then I don't have this in the paper, or we don't have this in the paper, but we basically slice and dice the data a bunch of different ways. So if you split our trades into spreads of a penny, uh, spreads between one and five cents, five and 10 cents, or more than 10 cents, um, you can basically see the amount of price improvement as we get of NBBO is exactly the same in the bins, right? So it doesn't really matter what spread it is. Um, you get the same pricing everywhere. Um, if you look at trade, uh, if you look at the price of the stock, again, if you look peruse quickly here, you can see it's basically the same. If you look at S&P 500, non-S&P 500, you can basically see it's the same. I'm going fast because it's all the same. And if you look at low or high volume, basically it's all the same. So it doesn't matter which way you cut the data. It doesn't matter which block you look in. Basically, the brokers are giving you the same execution um, regardless of what stocks you're trading on average in these bins. Um, and so in terms of a percent of, of NBBO price improvement is incredibly consistent um, by broker across any of the particular stocks we're looking at. All right, and I'll take a break here and see if there's any questions that anybody wants to ask. All right, go uh, ahead, Rick. Hank? Yeah, so uh, uh, really uh, creative approach doing your own uh, doing your own trades, uh, but of course the issues aren't new. So I think it's been close to twenty years since the SEC's required uh, uh, market centers to uh, 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 report on execution quality, um, and uh, uh, I think you mentioned also broker broker reports on execution quality. So uh, are you does the same sort of pattern show up there? And uh, if if not, uh, uh, any thoughts about why not? Yeah, so in the next segment, I'm going to show that those reports are completely useless. Uh, based on those market center data and the 606 data, the execution quality expected between all of our brokers would be exactly the same. Um, so so before before you jump to useless, I mean, uh, your, your experiment is, is a powerful experiment, uh, but you, you are a given set of traders and, and different brokerages have different sets, different mixes of traders. Uh, how does sure. that affect your thinking? Um, I, so I, I, again, I mean, maybe for limit orders it matters. So I'll, let me say for market orders, probably they're close to useless. Um, I mean, basically the market centers have admitted to us that they're useless. So, I mean, um, I mean, they don't have odd lots, right? 605s don't have odd lots, right? They give you hundred to 499 shares, which I mean, after you get past that, it's like most of the market, but I mean, essentially the, the, the issue here is, is that all of these brokerages use the same market centers and all the market centers, except for maybe one or two that, that get almost no volume, give you the same average execution quality. So the issue here is that the 605s give you average execution quality for that particular market center. So Citadel, for example, again, is only going to give you the average price improvement for an Apple market trade, regardless of where it came from, right? So it's not going to provide you information at the broker level. So unless the brokers are using different market centers, you know, you're basically going to end up. So we go through this exercise where you take the 606 data and the 605 data, and all the execution should be the same, um, basically because everybody's using the same market centers, and then the market center just report average execution. Um, so you know, if you don't know what the market center is doing in terms of each particular client, then you can't really use them to figure out differences between brokers. Um, and and I'll just also mention the brokers have no idea, by the way. The brokers have freely admitted that they had no idea what order they would be in our paper before we told them. So we've heard that from two or three different brokers that they had no idea uh, what order they were in. So if the brokers have no idea, then I can't imagine possibly how investors wouldn't have an idea. But you know, we're, we're going to go through that exercise. Go ahead, uh, Albert. I think you're next. Yeah, I, I, this is a very intriguing set of results. But I'm I'm a bit lost in the in the larger uh, message here uh, in terms of the economics because. What I learned so far is that there is peak um, uh, variation across brokers. So some are really good and consistently so, and for different types. Uh, I've done TD Ameritrade, seems to be on top of the charts everywhere. But how can they be in an economic equilibrium? Uh, isn't it irrational for them to give so much away 
unless there, there is some sort of, uh, you know, sometimes you want to buy market share. If you're small to begin with, you give large discounts just to have more customers signed on. Or, so I'm trying to see where, um, where all of this might be coming from. Yeah, so that's one of the things we're going to talk about. The next segment is kind of the economics of, of why TD might get different execution than, than Robinhood, for example. So we're going to talk about the economics coming up. Okay. Yeah, Chester. Chester, you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, so you characterize the this the these the reports from the SEC as useless, and and certainly industry people have commented over the over the last decade or more that uh, along such lines. Um, but but I'm not I'm not sure what what your kind of affirmative recommendation is because what you know what I understand is that it didn't pick up the differences in performance that you're that you generated for your style. Um, so I'm, I'd be interested in what you think the the the, the correct design uh, of the of the of the report of the re, of the of the report should be. Presum yeah. Presumably, it shouldn't be focused upon your experiment, um, which is very interesting and very creative. Um, um, but I, so I'd be interested, you know, in in that in in you know, if you can elaborate a little bit when you say that it's useless. Industry people have been saying that for a long time, even without doing your experiment. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit in the next section about recommendations. But I mean, the bottom line here is 606, 605 should A, have odd lots and B, you know, B by broker, right? So there should be some broker level 605 data um, that's reported. And then probably for the average consumer, that's not going to be particularly helpful. Um, so essentially, you know, I, I would say for each broker, you know, you can pick like maybe odd lots and round lots and then different orders and then basically report your percentage of price improvement or how much, you know, the average thousand dollar trade loses. Um, but there's certainly no data that breaks out by broker what's happening. Um, and so clearly there's a lot of differences there. So, I mean, that would be our guess on the best thing to do. I'm, the SEC has about 4,000 things they want to try to do in terms of changing structure. You know, they want to do best execution by order versus an aggregate. And, and so we're not sure how that will ultimately affect the plumbing. So we're kind of more focused on the on. The, yeah. So so at least on the odd set. lot issue, certainly there's, you know, there's other papers that have been pushing, 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 pushing that theme with sort of, you know, detailed analysis of the of the of the of the of the, of the, odd, of the odd lot executions and how much how much how, how much availability there actually might 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 be. So you you might want to think about the connection of your work to the, to that. Yep. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Chris, this is very interesting. Uh, have you checked whether you know two investors at the same broker uh, would would they always get the same price improvement, or would, could there be any kind of difference between the traders uh, themselves based on their history, for example? <laughs> so that's um, a great question, um, and I don't know. We don't know the answer. So two of us didn't trade the same account at the same place, admittedly. Um, I, I, someone told me, and I'm not allowed to disclose who or where, um, that it, it used to be that brokers would actually include the account number when they routed the trades to market centers. Um, so that was, yeah, back I, in the, I heard the same, uh, I think your investor yeah. ID also is attached uh, to the router. So, so that, yeah, so that knows. yeah, so yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I can't comment on that if people, if they're discriminating, not only by broker, but by account. Um, we were told by Schwab that they specifically look for accounts that have toxic trading um, and try to weed those out. So, you know, I think someone's paying attention, but whether or not we've gotten to the point where, you know, Citadel is giving different pricing to different clients at the same brokerage account, that that I don't, I, I can't comment on. So. Also, with the market order, since you observe the API, you also see the, the, the data at the ask, uh, at this, you know, order submission time. Uh, have you seen any? you know, giant changes when you send the order because of the latency, all of a sudden NBO changes. You um, could, you know, maybe track yeah. it from your API plus the TAC report. Yeah, so that's one thing that we, you know, um, that's one thing we didn't do. So that one of the things that if you look at round trip trade um, in order, it doesn't matter, you know, there are percent. So one thing I was concerned, if you look at price improvement percent, and we're moving NBBO, then our percents could be the same, but we could still be getting different execution. Um, but for round trip trade, I mean, even if NBBO is moving, then then that would that would um, that it would get caught up in that. But yeah, we haven't looked to see how much it trade. I mean, latency is pretty small, 
I mean, I want to say, I think it's, it's probably from the time we put the order into execution, most of the time is less than a second. There's not a lot of latency in there. Um, uh, but uh, we, we could probably look at, at that a little bit more. I think we have uh, one more question. Yeah, Chris, do you um, know if the sweep account that you're trading from for each of the brokerage uh, firms is wholly owned by them and what the expense ratio is for each sweep account? Um, so again, I don't know anything about market structure. So what's a sweep account? Well, it's the account that you're trading from. So there, there's Wait. some expense associated with the account that you're trading from. That expense is internalized by the broker. Oh, there yeah, can... I, I... Okay. Yeah, Something, I no it's a, a countervailing thing. That's fine. No worries. Yeah. Um, yeah. For all I know, they could be charging me dollars a day and I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think there are some days I think like uh, the Robinhood account was down like 700 bucks or something. So, um, so I, I didn't, I didn't really. Um, most of that. the accounts, most of the accounts have no fees. Yeah. Uh, no ongoing as, fees. Yeah. And do as they, as, so the, the overnight funds that say in that stay in there, do you get the same rate on them? It's not the uh, fee. The... Yeah, I mean, I have no idea. I mean, because we use the API to capture our actual trade. So, I mean, we don't use the balances to calculate the returns, right? We use the actual trade prices. So anything else that's happening in the accounts is transcendental to this. I should also note that IB Pro returns here are not including commissions. So these are just the execution. These don't include the commissions for the Pro account. So this is the just the actual trade prices that we're getting that are included here. Right. Thanks. Yep. Sorry again. Um, I'm not a mi microstructure person, so kind of stupid. Go ahead. Uh, so Chris, let's um, let's finish this and then um, get back to the remaining questions. Yeah. Sure. So um, so basically, this 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 panel here sums up the re oh, here. I'm going to do this. There we go. My mouse is too fast. This figure here basically sums up the relation between our price improvement and payment for order flow. Um, so this is the scale. So the y-axis is the price improvement that we're getting. Um, and then the x-axis is the amount of payment for order flow the brokers are receiving. Um, and you can essentially see you could draw almost a straight line between these because the execution difference in terms of payment uh, price improvement, it just dwarfs uh, the amount that people are getting for payment for order flow. So I don't know what POPF is in my title there, but payment for order flow is just tiny. Um, and so just to put these numbers in context, basically you can see um, we calculate the difference in our, our price improvement and compare that to the difference in payment for order flow that brokers are getting. So the first thing you can see here um, is, you know, we're talking tiny amounts of payment for order flow. So TD for one share gets 0.1 cents for every share for payment for order flow, and our average price improvement is almost eight cents. So basically, you know, payment for order flow is only about 1.2 percent of our price improvement. Um, E-Trade gets double the amount of payment for order flow, 0.2 cents. Um, Robinhood gets just a little bit more, 2.17 cents. Um, and then you can see, you know, Fidelity and our IBKR Pro basically get zero. We don't have APKR light here because the IBKR 606 is really difficult to read. So we kind of excluded that because we couldn't figure out what's going on, but I'm sure it would make a difference. Um, and then basically you can see if you do the percentage of payment for order flow divided by the percentage of price improvement, um, you can see here that basically these differences are tiny and they're zero. And the easiest way to explain this is TD gets way better price than Fidelity TD gets payment for order flow, Fidelity does not, right? So this idea that execution quality and the payment for order flow amount you get is, is and at least in our data, we don't see any relationship between the two. Um, maybe there is one there and, and, and we just don't see it because it gets swamped by other things, which I'll come up in a moment, but it, it's, just, it's just not there. All right, so if it's not payment for order flow, then what's causing our differences, right? And I'll try to sum up quick. I know we're a little bit behind. Um, so one is basically that the brokers are using different venues. Right, so one broker is using Citadel and one using Virtue. Um, the second is is that brokers are systematically, you know, one broker is better at routing stocks than the other. Right, so one broker is doing smart routing and another one's doing dumb routing, and somehow they're routing your stocks to the worst market, possible market center that they use. And the third one is basically broker execution, which means that trades are going to the same market center at the same time and getting totally different execution. Um, and again, the way that we kind of dig into this is the first two we're going to use SEC reports for, and the third one we know where our trades go, so we can actually go and look and see what happens when our trades are going to the same market center. All right, so this gets back to the first question about how much, how valuable are the disclosures that you're getting? 
All right, so these are essentially for the four brokers that use all the same wholesalers. Again, we didn't include IBKR here. They don't give us our data, so we can't do anything with them. But as noted, they're probably using their own ATS. Um, and you can basically see here that, again, you have three market centers that are dominating. So Citadel, Virtue, and G1X are basically dominating the market. You have Jane Street, Two Sigma, and UBS that are, are lower underneath. <clears throat> All right, basically all the same brokers are using the same market centers. And so what we do is, is again, we take the percentage of trades that are going to each one of these market centers. Then we use the 605 data provided by the market center, multiply that by the price improvement on average they gave for the, uh, each one of our stocks that we trade and compute the price improvement that we'd expect based on the 605 and the 606 data. And you can see the expected PI essentially is the same for every one of our four brokers, right? It, it, they're all exactly the same because except for these two bottom market centers, which basically nobody uses, these four market centers all have the same average execution and all of the brokers are using those market centers. So when I say they're useless, I guess maybe that's a strong quote, um, but for our particular paper, our particular trades, again, you can see here that we would expect no difference in execution uh, based on what we see. And then you can see the actual amount of price improvement that we get below, and you can see the differences are huge, right? So these are for S&P 500 stocks, um, if you use all the stocks, it doesn't matter or whatever. So it's the same type of thing. The 606 doesn't really, and 605s don't help you. We do another experiment <laughs> where um, we basically look at if you route it to the worst possible place, um, constraining the fact that, you know, basically we know what market centers you used. Um, you can go and see whether or not, you know, basically bad routing is causing what we're doing. Um, so I, I, basically the idea here is we have the price improvement from each market center. We know where, stock, where brokers are routing the trades. And so we use a minimum, a minimum solver in Excel basically to go through really quickly and say, well, constraining where you send the trades because we know where they went and the data that we have for price improvement, if you systematically routed stocks to the worst possible place, um, how much price improvement would you have? Um, and you can see, again, that really doesn't explain the differences that we find. Um, so for example, in January, uh, Robinhood got worse execution on 90% of the stocks we traded than the very worst market center that they used. So literally Robinhood for 90% of the stocks, even if they route it to the worst market center, 605 data that Robinhood uses, that 90% of the time our price improvement was worse than what Robinhood had, right? So again, there's no possible way this could be a routing issue because you know, basically the 605s, there's no way to get 90% worse execution. So the bottom line here is we try to do really bad execution uh, by the broker. So the broker is systematically sending to the worst market center, and even then we can't explain our results. Um, and so I'm going fast here because we're behind time and basically getting to the punchline. So the last thing we do is we can look at our parallel trade. So what happens when we put a trade in TD and we put a trade in Robinhood and they end up at the same market center? So both our trades go to Citadel, both our trades go to G1X, both our trades go to Jane Street and compare the execution, right? Because then it's not a market center difference, it's not a routing difference, it's basically the same market center, same trade, same time, different broker, and you can see that's what's driving our results. So you can basically see here, systematically, our trades from TD are getting way better execution than our trades from Robinhood, systematically, all the time. And we're not talking one or two trades, we have you know, like 4,000 trades where they're overlapping, where they go to the same market center at the same time. If we look at E-Trade, you can see it's the same thing here. All right, for whatever vir reason, Virtue gives really good execution to E-Trade. Um, they were really quick to answer all of our questions, except I asked them why they're giving such better pricing to E-Trade than any other market center, and then they never responded to that one, probably for good reason. All right, so uh, the theory is, is that they're, they're sending all their limit, E-Trade sending all their limit orders to Virtue and they're getting the rebates from the exchange. And so there's a hush-hush agreement. That's what I was told, I don't know. Anyway, but you can see here, basically it's a, the, the market centers are discriminating against brokers and that's what's driving the execution differences that we see in our paper. It's not payment for order flow um, or, or maybe it's a small component, but basically you can see it, it doesn't explain our results and it's the, it's the, the market centers that are causing the difference. All right. Um, so I'm going to skip this part. So this is what we've been told, right? So we can't prove any of these things, but this is what we've been told uh, by the market centers and by Schwab, right? So we've only really heard from the winners and they, it sounds like they use the same PR firm. Um, so in theory, you'd expect that firms that get higher payment for order flow should get worse execution, right? That's standard economics, right? If you pay more, then you should want to get more profit. Um, but in practice, we just don't see it. So it must be getting swamped by something else. The big argument that we've heard from the market centers is that basically order flow from different brokers has different profitability, right? So essentially, you know, Robinhood is one-sided trading. It's very hard to cross. 
They can't make a lot of money. Everybody trades Bed Bath & Beyond. Um, and so we have to give them worse pricing because basically on each trade, we can make less money because it's harder to cross. TD trades are very even. Uh, there's order buy and sells, it's pretty much random. And so it's very easy for them to cross and make money. This is the explanation that we've been told by the market centers. Um, I'm presenting to Robinhood tomorrow and I look very much look forward looking to what they think about that particular argument. In the journal, they told the reporter that they don't have toxic flow. Um, so I'm not sure whether or not Robinhood believes this argument, but this is the argument told us by Virtue, Citadel and Schwab, or as I like to call them, the winners. Um, so I'm pretty excited to talk to well, for all lack of a better term, the, one of the losers tomorrow and see what their uh, opinion is on, on their toxicity of their order flow. And of course, there's a nice peanuts here where we can say that, well, there's a nice theory they fed us, but we have no way to prove whether or not it's true. Um, and essentially, we just have to believe that uh, order quality is different. All right. So uh, I know I'm over time and I'm, I'm guessing there's more questions. So basically, we do a trading experiment that reveals some very unexpected execution differences between brokers. Um, payment for order flow is, is relatively small and the variation is not related to the variation in execution that we see. Um, and essentially we find that the variations are due to basically market centers systematically discriminating against brokers. Um, and it could be due to things like order flow, size of order flow, even different brokerage objectives. It could just be brokers are lazy. Um, we have no way to prove the economics of why they're getting different order flow, just the explanations that have been giving to us. Um, and then in, in terms of recommendations, we talked about this earlier, you know, basically the current disclosure is really insufficient. Um, I mean, if we're in a world where the brokers don't even know what order they'd be in until we post the paper, then probably we need some better, um, better disclosure, right? If the brokers don't know, how are investors supposed to know? Um, and so our suggestions include things like expanding 605s to have odd lot. And someone mentioned there's some other papers about that. There's a great paper with O'Hare as a co-author on MBBO in the inside market. Um, expanding 60, you know, 605s for quality by broker, for example. Um, and so we just need some better disclosure on what the actual retail price is, um, because definitely there's a huge difference between the six brokers that, that we trade. So, um, and then with that, I'll stop and um, sorry for going a little bit over. I'm happy to answer uh, questions people have. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, folks, um, let's ask as many questions as we have. Uh, Yash? Um, hi, Chris. Great talk. Thank you. This is really interesting. Um, so I like looking at the table seven in your paper. So basically, you can see that interactive brokers charge uh, or demand the smallest amount of price improvement and charge no PFOF, right? And then the question is, why isn't all the wholesalers uh, competing tooth and nail to get that order flow? So there's, there's no reason why wholesalers wouldn't compete for that cheap order flow from interactive brokers, which gets us to the question, like, if this is an equilibrium, what explains it, you have all these explanations that, that you provided. And I want to get back to uh, Hank's point, the fact that you have um, different bodies of traders um, at different brokerages, and then the fact that there could be different toxicity in the, these order flows that would show up in, in the pricing. So one way you, I think you might uh, want to consider to, to address that, given that you're still trading, um, is use the publicity of, of your study um, to see whether traders are going to respond to, to what you've reported, right? Presumably, if this is toxicity, then more sophisticated investors would now think, oh, I want to trade at a broker where, where uh, I get better price improvement, right? And then you can possibly use a definitive uh, setting to sort of look at that. And if you don't see that effect, I think that would be also interesting in that, well, it's either not responding or that there is some, some other things that are being endogenized uh, in the setting. Yeah, I mean, we've been warned that our execution could be suddenly getting better because they know our broker ID and can target our trades, right? I haven't looked at the data in four months, um, but yeah, I mean, certainly, I mean, we would love to be able to figure out, you know, say that, you know, which explanation is true. I mean, my gut tells me that Citadel makes more money on a Robinhood trade on average than they do a TD trade still. Um, but you know they're not going to blow up their 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 model and tell us that. But I mean, certainly we're going to look at the execution on our on our trades. Just haven't had a chance to pull up the data. So uh, go ahead. Yeah, one more question, Chris. Uh, so Robinhood mentions on their website that they actually convert each market order to a marketable limit with five percent mm -hmm. markup, yeah. and they also do this for buy orders, but not for sell orders. Have you looked at any difference between you know buy versus sell at Robinhood and see any difference 
No, so the buy, buy orders and sell orders, I, I looked at the same thing because we trade shares and not dollars. Um, so if you're not familiar, Robinhood basically takes your, if you place an order for buy for shares, they convert it into a market limit order of a 5% col color. If you do a, a order for dollars, then they leave it as a market order. But on the sell side, they don't change anything. So if you look at sells versus buys, our percent of price improvements is exactly the same. So I looked at the same thing, which is, which is strange. So I think Interactive Broker, by the way, does the same thing for our market orders. Um, because on the Interactive Broker ATS 605, they don't have one entry in the entire 605 for market orders. Um, so they must be converting our market orders to marketable limit and then throwing them out on the exchange. Um, in terms of, by the way, uh, just earlier question uh, response, Interactive Broker keeps all these trades from themselves because they keep the price improvement. They don't want to farm this out to wholesalers. That's how they're making all of their money. Um, you know, and so I'm sure they're more than happy to keep keep all that price improvement for themselves and give it out to a wholesaler for 0.1 cents. Uh, Marcus, go ahead. Uh, hi, I was wondering if your results sort of point out that there are clientels of retail traders where DD Ameritrade takes all the uninformed, all the, the, the small the small <laughs> guys, and who are more valuable because they're, they're they're dumber. And Robinhood gets the people who coordinate on Reddit, which are perhaps a yeah. bit riskier, and that's why the order flow is worth less. And, and I, I, in the beginning, you mentioned that you select some large caps and you select some, some meme stocks, some stuff that are, are very retail heavy. Do you see any difference between these two groups? No, so if you look at the top movers every day versus like our core group of stocks, the price improvement we get across brokers is the same. So as I mentioned, I, I, think, I think basically the market centers just have a execution mean that they're trying to go on price improvement as NBBO and they don't, they don't really change versus you know every stock. It's too much work for them to try every day to, to change it. I mean, certainly, you know, I I, I would argue that our uh, you know co you know JF paper the same people basically wrote. You know, we would say that no one's dumber than Robinhood traders. But again, you know, that terms of if it's coordinated order flow and you can't cross, then it's not worth as much to wholesalers. I mean, I think we all believe there's some truth to that arguments, um, but you know. It, in terms of 100% of the difference, how much that can explain, you know, we have no idea. Is it 50, 20, 80, 90? Um, and that's the hard part because we just, we don't have the data to prove or dis disprove that. So that's that's the hard part. But certainly you can imagine there's um, difference. So the other thing just to note, we've heard that Fidelity basically, uh, they have a bunch of people that are clearinghouse for and they just put all their trades in. So Fidelity is not just Fidelity brokerage account clients, but there's other clearinghouse clients they throw in. And that's one of the issues with their order flow. That's what we've been told about Fidelity. <clears throat> Hank? Yeah, so uh, I mean, uh, really interesting, really thought provoking. Um, but with that, with that in mind, and, and you mentioned you're not really a microstructure guy until you got, got into the trading here. Uh, so maybe uh, I can kind of throw this question out to the group. Um, so my reaction, you know, beyond the fact that there's differences across brokerages, which, which is really interesting. Uh, my other reaction is, uh, wow, there's a lot of price improvement, uh, big price improvement, and uh, uh, lots of midpoint executions. Uh, so, you know, my inclination is to think, wow, price competition is really working, uh, except you're telling me the SEC reports are not informative, the brokers didn't even know this, uh, you know, what are the odds that the retail traders know it? So, so you know, if, if people don't know about the price improvements, you know, what are the forces that are, that are giving us what looks like intense price competition, uh, and in particular, all those midpoint uh, executions? Uh, and then related to that, uh, zero commission trading, uh, uh, relatively narrow spreads, lots of price improvement, lots of midpoint executions. Uh, you know, the brokers uh, still have to be making money. They are making money. Uh, the question came up about, uh, you know, are they getting it all off of uh, interest on sweep accounts? Uh, anyway, let me just throw that throw that out there and see if anybody has any reactions. Yeah, Chris, so you're, you're can, first, I of course. Just, a couple of just quick comments. So, so one is, of course, the midpoint pricing is, is, is somewhat confined to TD, right? So, I mean, there's TD and then there's everybody else, right? Um, I think there's a couple of things I'll just note. So number one is I don't know if a standalone broker works anymore, right? So if you look at, you know, so E-Trade got bought by Morgan Stanley, right? So E-Trade is not independent anymore. TD's got bought by Schwab, right? TD also had a huge RIA business that they make money on. Right, as the Schwab. So, you know, that's another thing. E Trade, I mean, uh, Robinhood never makes money, right? Almost all their money is basically off of crypto. They made half their money off crypto and they don't make money. I, I don't know if you can be a standalone brokerage now. I mean, they're trying to securities lending and they're trying to turn themselves into a bank like E Trade did. 
you know, I don't know if there's a model in which Robin Hood can make money. I mean, that's, I'm just going to throw that out there for the group. That's just my personal opinion. You know, we don't comment on if commission free is good or not. I think that if you were to ask, you know, I'll give you my personal opinion. I think commission free is good for most retail traders, right? Um, even probably if price improvement was a lot worse than what they're getting on average, I still think it's fine because they're trading small trades, right? Um, you know, in terms of, but, but then there's all these issues about on exchange versus on exchange and the issues with NBBO, right? So if you moved everything back on the exchange and NBBO is a lot more narrow, um, then the question becomes what would actual execution be if NBBO was tightened up um, and it wasn't so easy to provide price improvement. Um, and so, you know, those are just some philosophical questions. The last thing I'll just mention in terms of uh, why market centers give so much price improvement, and Schwab talked a lot about this, um, is basically they want to make sure there's all, more than one market center. Because if there's only one market center, they're going to get horrible execution. And Philippe can talk about a paper that looks at execution in Europe, where basically there's only one place trades get executed and everyone gets crappy pricing because they have a monopoly. And TD actually talked about how they're willing to send orders to a place that has slightly worse execution just to make sure that we don't end up in a world where it's just virtue and citadel, right? Um, because if there, we need that competition at the market center level or otherwise we're all gonna end up with crappy execution. Um, so those are my quick thoughts. And then of course, you know, I'm very interested to hear what the group, the group has to think. <clears throat> Thanks. So. Um, I was hoping to come back for a second to the usefulness or uselessness of the 605, 606 reports. Um, so Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but most of your trades are odd lots, right? Um, I, I didn't catch that from the tables. And then 605, I think, explicitly excludes odd lots. So, yeah, so in a way, we are comparing sl slightly different apples here. Maybe that is what explains the discrepancies that you're showing between your execution quality and what you see in 605. Yeah, so we actually, um, so there's a paper that says that odd lot trades get worse execution because they don't show up on 605s. So we actually did a comparison of the execution of our round lots versus non-round lots and the execution is the same. So we don't really see any difference between odd lots and non-odd lot trades. But certainly, yeah, for the 605s, we had to use the 100 to 499 share bucket. Um, and it could be if they did put odd lot data in there that we'd see a bigger difference. Um, so, but I mean, again, I, I think when you look at the actual routing results and you see that, you know, systematically Robinhood's getting worse trades at the same market center, um, my guess is you probably wouldn't pick that up on an aggregated, right? Because you're just going to get the average of the two and it's going to say you get like 30% price improvement. So, the, the yeah. Whole, uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't know if, if, if that would be helpful, but I mean, certainly it's, you know, given that 70% almost of the market now is odd lotted. I mean, it seems odd uh, that they don't have those in their disclosure. So I'm working on my dad puns. So I apologize about that. <laughs> I know they're very good. Um, and it, so since you mentioned Robinhood again, uh, and since you're talking to them tomorrow, it would be interesting to find out how they managed to get the largest PFOF in the industry, given that they supposedly have this one-sided tricky order flow that they send. Because they are, I think, the, the largest PFOF of all the retail brokers. It's actually not that much more than E-Trade, actually, if you weight it. So their PFOP on S&P 500 stocks is a lot. It's really high compared to the others. But if you weight across S&P 500 and non-S&P 500, so they get on average 0.217 cents per share, uh, and E-Trade basically gets uh, 0.2 cents. So the difference isn't remarkably more than E-Trade. Um, one of the interesting things about you know the 606 is you can actually bake, break out what percentage of trades are S&P 500, non-S&P 500. Um, so for Robinhood, 95% of their trades are non-S&P 500 stocks, and only 5% are S&P 500. Um, so, so they cer certainly have a unique clientele, that's for sure. Um, oh, Tom, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, so I was going to say something related to Hank's point, and maybe one minor point in the slides, which is, you know, uh, best execution is a lot more than just beating the NBBO. Mm -hmm. You have to have some sort of process formally established, like this is how we're going to get best execution for our clients. So one industry talking point, so we, we've heard the same industry talking point that you mentioned, which is, you know, they, they'll route to people who are suboptimal just to keep them in there, you know, to keep from getting a Citadel virtue duopoly. One other industry talking point we've heard a lot is uh, PFOF is fixed. So they're going to charge the same PFOF from every single market maker. And that allows them to really mark, uh, route more to whichever market maker is giving the best price improvement. So, so, uh, so we certainly, uh, 
have heard this. Yeah. So if you look at PFOP, so I think that's one of the biggest misnomers is people say, well, they have an incentive to send it to Virtue or Citadel because one of them gets more. It's all the same. So yeah, I mean, that's on the 606. That's clear. Um, so one of the interesting things I didn't or we don't have in the paper is we obviously have routing on a lot of stocks. Um, and you can actually see that, you know, so TD, for example, does not do smart routing. So if you take a particular stock and you see in the first three months that they get worse execution at one market center than another, the next three months, they do not reallocate. So basically what TD does is they give slices of their order flow evenly to each market center. They don't discriminate um, versus if you look at Robinhood, they actually do smart routing. So you can see how they change where they route our stocks based on which market center is giving them um, best execution. Um, and so, you know, there's an interesting probably perspective there on whether or not the SEC wants to make every trade, uh, you know, best execution, right? So one of the rules they want to change instead of an aggregate best execution, look at trade by trade best execution. Um, because obviously I think all of us would prefer to get TD execution, um, even though Robinhood does smart routing. So, but yeah, your major point about PFOP being the same for all the market centers, that's true. So routing routing is another really interesting thing to look at. So I think Fidelity does smart routing or non-random routing as well. E-Trade and, and, and a TD for sure, they do random routing across our market centers. By the way, we did not use university funds for this for whoever asked in the chat. So we lost, we decided we had too much money. We needed a tax deduction. Uh, so this is all personal uh, money that we lost. Other comments, questions? Um, I, I have a very geeky quick thing. Um, the uh, When you guys compare it to TAC, which timestamp do you use? And the reason I'm saying this, we have a very interesting paper coming up in a couple of weeks that says that uh, we should all switch unless we have already to uh, uh, market participant timestamps in TAC instead of the, uh, the main timestamp that it sort of throws at you. So just curious what you are using there. Um, I'm assuming I uh, we use the main time timestamp. I mean, I I would say it was funny. You know, a Wall Street Journal reporter asked for a trade to look up one trade for a U.S. Steel, and there's like a bazillion trades. I mean, usually, I mean, it's pretty unique within a few seconds um, each trade, especially when you get down to four four digit pricing, right? Uh, quantity, yeah. time, four digit pricing. So, I mean, the nice part is uh, for most of our trades, we have the execution down to the millisecond through the API. Uh, the only hard part is is that the time on our computer clock. And so that's from the broker. So that matches TAC. Um, the issue comes for, for the ones where they give us to the second because we can't use the time on our computer, even though it's the same second, because obviously the milliseconds matter. But you know, in terms of matching the TAC, we just use the main, the main time. I don't, I don't think that uh, for us, that'll make a difference. Have you tried calculating price improvement against the mid quote at the time you submit the order versus at the time it goes through? Um, so I think someone asked that earlier. We, we don't. I mean, that's maybe a second difference. So I mean, I think it would just add noise. I will say if you do use the APIs to capture bid ask spread quote that uh, most of them only update every 15 seconds. So if you try to use the data from the APIs, they're pretty outdated. The only API that updates in real time seems to be TD. So TD, TD gives us the correct, if you compare it to the one calculated by TAC, TD matches the one from TAC. And I think Robinhood's wrong half the time, but it's not. It's not like a, it's not systematically biased. It's just, it's on average, the bias is zero. It's just this wrong because they only update it like every 15 seconds or something like that. So, I've looked at way too much data the last five and a half months. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, folks, uh, I don't see any more hands up. Um, this is the last opportunity. I think we've exhausted Chris. And Chris, thanks again for uh, joining us. It is pretty early for you. Um, and thank you all very much for coming. Uh, we are going to come back in two weeks with Marcos um, Baldauf. Uh, very interesting paper. Um, thanks again, Chris and Philippe, and um, see you guys soon. All right, thanks for having us.